welcome back to the wonderful world of online economics. This is another lecture in this series on markets, using the tools of supply and demand to analyze markets. So anytime we use these tools of supply and demand to analyze markets, the first thing we do is correctly label our axis. So we got P for the vertical axis and Q for the horizontal axis. So that's the price in the market and the quantity in the market. And then we're going to draw our X marks our spot. First, we're going to start with our downward sloping demand curve. So we're going to draw that downward sloping demand curve, label that D. And before we draw supply, we'll remember that demand is a what? It's a schedule of the various amounts of an item that buyers are willing and able to sell. I have a series of prices for a specified amount of time. So it displays the inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. Price goes up, quantity demanded goes down. Price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. Right, so that's the law of demand and the explanation of demand. Then we draw supply. And supply is the various amounts of an item, so a good or a service or a resource, that sellers are willing and able to make available for sale. Again, series of prices, specified amount of time. And there's a direct relationship between price and quantity supply. So when price goes up, sellers are willing and able to sell more. They're happy because price is now reward for them. Price goes down, quantity supply goes down. Right? So Chertibus Paribus, other things being equal, the most important determinant of both demand and supply is the price of the market. But the purpose of these videos is to analyze what happens when something other than price changes, our quote-unquote non-price determinants. So we have five non-price determinants of demand and six non-price determinants of supply. In this particular example, we're going to go over one of the non-price determinants of demand. And this is the corn, C-O-R-N, sorry, not P-O-R-N, corn market up top. Let's write that up, C-O-R-N. Corn, 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 sorry. Very bland, bland, you know, boring. All right, but, all right, so a couple years back, our genius president, George Bush the second, whatever, George Walker Bush, right, he came up with this ethanol policy, right? So prior to the ethanol policy, prior to this alternative energy, quote, unquote, alternative energy idea, what was going on with the corn market? Well, the obvious sellers in the corn market are easy to identify. You simply had thousands of corn farmers. So you just have lots and lots and lots of corn farmers. And this is a good market to analyze because it's almost a purely competitive market because corn is corn is corn is corn. It's pretty much the same no matter where you buy it. And no single seller can differentiate their own, their own product from others. So you have thousands of sellers, all the corn growers. And then you ask yourself, well, who are the demanders of corn? We can really break the buyers of corn, the demand, into two segments. One would be people like you and, I, you and I, households. And we bought corn for various things. You know, obviously we bought corn for consumption. And then we might buy corn for things like, you know, like baking, soda, and that, that type of stuff, and corn, corn grits and stuff. I, and then producers bought corn. There were two types of producers who bought corn. I, producers bought corn to make feed for animals. Right, so that was a big item for, for corn, a big set of buyers. And then corn is also an additive for other uh, food items when we talk about producers. So for instance, a lot of manufacturers of anything that needs to be sweetened, like sodas or candies and such, high fructose corn syrup, obviously they bought corn, right? So there's your buyers and your sellers in the corn market. But along comes this ethanol policy, right? So the ethanol policy was an attempt to bring down the average price of fuel, or to at least uh, provide an alternative fuel for automobiles, right? So what happened? Well, all of a sudden, we're going to make biodiesel from corn. So we're going to use corn for a different, totally different use than before. So here we have, we're going to write this down, an increase in the number of buyers. All right, that's the non-price determinant. And then after the, non after the word buyers, B-U-Y-E-R-S, we're going to put in parentheses, who, who were these buyers? Right. Number of buyers. And in parentheses, we're going to write down ethanol producers. Because any business that was in the function of producing ethanol, they would obviously need to buy corn. Right? So let's see how the ethanol policy, the ethanol uh, fuel policy, altered the price of corn. Well, what's that going to do? Underneath this, we're going to write down another hyphen. We're going to write down an arrow up, and we're going to write the word demand. 
So an increase in the number of buyers in the market will increase demand. Now, of course, we're assuming that all buyers are going to sort of see coins the same utility, right? So here we have a rightward shift of demand. So we go a rightward shift of demand. And we'll label that D1. I'll actually, let's erase that real quick. We forgot to do one important thing. I, sorry, my bad, rushing through this. So prior to the increase in demand, prior to the increase in demand, we're going to erase this for a minute. Oops, that's all right. I just good, good review because you should do this on your own curves. All right, where were we before? Let's put in E1 where supply and demand come together. So prior to anything changing, we had a price and a quantity in the market. All right, so prior to anything changing, we had Q1 down bottom there, and we had P1. So this is the price and the quantity relationship. That was equilibrium before the ethanol policy. And now we have an increase in demand. All right, so new buyers enter the market, increase the number of buyers, the label is D1. So how does this affect the market for corn? Well, obviously, right, we're going to draw a new equilibrium, we'll label that E2. So at the new equilibrium, because of the increase in demand due to an increase in number of buyers, what happens to price and quantity? What happens to that relationship? All right, the, the key variables in, in, in any market. All right, so Q2 and P2. And we're going to write the word results over here, and we're going to say that price went up and quantity went up. All right, so price goes up and quantity goes up. Now let's think about this for a moment. How did the ethanol policy then affect the market for food? Well, remember, a lot of producers of manufactured packaged food items need corn. All right, so if the price of corn goes up, that's going to increase the price of all of those products. Now, these are other markets. I'm just talking about secondary effects. Uh, you would be done this problem. I'm just going, you know, going on a little bit tangent here and say, this is what happened in the market for corn. Because the increased number of buyers, you had an increase in the price, an increase in the quantity. Uh, but this had an effect on other markets. Right? Plus, if you think about what happened on the farms, if the price of corn goes up, right, what's going to happen next time? What's, how is it going to affect, say, a market for soy? Well, remember, if you had a farm, you had 10,000 acres, and you were planting half soy and half corn, the next year of planting, you might be enticed to plant more corn and less soy, right? So think about how that would affect the market for soy. Maybe we'll do that in the next video.